Before we begin today's episode, I'd like to make some quick shoutouts. Thank you to J Dabs Art and K Hopi or K Hoppy. I'm not sure how to say your username, but Katie Carroll, thank you so much for your love and support for this podcast. It means a lot to us. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we are also slowly adding videos onto YouTube. If YouTube is more of your thing, be sure to check us out. Also, we will have a special treat at the end of this episode. It'll be very Marvel esque. Be sure to tune in. Now, without further ado, Warning, the following podcast contains massive spoilers. If you haven't seen Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra yet, and don't mind spoilers, hopefully this podcast will inspire you to watch along with us. Now let's begin. Welcome. (laughs) <laughs> to Beyond Bending. No! <laughs> She's your host, Marilyn Chantala, and today I'll be your guest, Eddie Napati. You're taking over my podcast? Mm-hmm. Eddie is my husband, and he's also the one that created the intro for this podcast. I don't like it. What? <laughs> I need to redo it. We'll go back and redo it. Do you want to tell them what instrument you played it on? The ukulele. But it's not just any ukulele. It's a banjo ukulele. Did I play it on that one? Yeah. Oh. Anyways, today's episode we're going to be covering episode 5, The King of Omashu. And before we start, I just want to say, like, I love Avatar Roku's voice. When he does the recap for each episode, he's like, previously on Avatar. Is this the first one, or the first time we hear his voice? No, I just haven't mentioned it before, but I want to now. (laughs) Yeah, he has a soothing voice. Who does it? Um, IMDb. Dante Bosco. It's not Dante Bosco. (laughs) James Garrett? Wait, Roku was in Legend of Korra? Probably. Everyone was in Legend of Korra. I guess that makes sense. Thanks, James Garrett. He's Avatar Roku. He will forever be Avatar Roku. This guy. Oh, wow. Look at that mustache. Yeah, I would have never guessed. (laughs) Eddie showed me a picture he found on Google. He has a killer mustache. Anyways, so this episode starts off with Aang, Sokka, and Katara walking to the top of a hill. Aang puts his hands up in the air and yells out, The Earth Kingdom City of Omashu! We cut to a reverse shot. The camera pans up to show the beautiful city of Omashu. And Aang tells him how he used to come here all the time to hang out with his friend Boomy. Boom boom. Boom boom. (laughs) Katara and Sokka are freaking out because they've never actually seen a city before. Aang's super excited to go inside, but Katara warns him that it could be dangerous if the city knows that he's the Avatar. Sokka tells him that he needs a disguise. We cut to Aang with a mustache and like a lot of hair. We find out that he used Abba's hair for the disguise, and Sokka tells him that he looks just like his grandpa. Aang full on embraces the role of an old man, and Katara points out that he is technically 112 years old. Aang pretends to limp while he uses his glider as a walking stick, and the gang starts walking towards the entrance of Amashu. Aang tells Katara and Sokka how they're gonna love it there because I quote, The people of Omashu are the friendliest people in the world. Right when he says this, we hear a guard yelling at a man that's trying to get into the city. The guard earthbends his food stand over the bridge and we hear the man yell out, No! My cabbages! Aang approaches the guard and the guard earthbends a huge boulder over Aang's head. He tells Aang to state his business. Aang sticks his finger in the guard's face and starts yelling at him. This catches the guard by surprise. The boulder crashes right next to Sokka and Katara, and they watch in awe as Aang continues to yell at the guard that it's none of his business why they're there. Oh, he also, like, introduces himself. Bonzu Pippin Padalopsicopolis the <laughs> third. Come on, Marilyn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, the guard tells Aang to calm down and decides to let them through. As Aang, Sokka, and Katara pass through the gates, the guard sees Momo's ears sticking out of Aang's hair. But before he can say anything, the gates close from behind them. So his name is Bonzu... Pippin Padalopsicopolis the third. <laughs> With that pause. Shout out to my brother Jared, who changed his middle name to Pippin Padalopsicopolis on Snapchat. But yeah, that's crazy how Katara and Sokka have never been to a city before. I mean, it's not surprising because they've grown up in like a small village their whole lives. And then what is it? The next town they see is... They see Kiyoshi. Yeah, they see Kiyoshi Island. It's like a town. 
Yeah, I guess this is their first real Earth Kingdom that they see. And it's pretty great. When they reach the top of the hill and they look at Amashu from far away, it's so gorgeous. Oh my god. Yeah, I always wondered like how it's still up. Did the firebenders just not get to any of the Earth Kingdoms yet? Because I know like they take over Omashu. Like they know there's a war, right? They're not like bossing say. Well, yeah, because you see Aang telling Katar and Sok that the, like a hundred years ago, they used to be the nicest city in the mm, world. They got more strict. Yeah, and now the guard doesn't even care if it's an old man. He just threatens him with a boulder and he's like, what are you doing here? It's like a trope, though, where it's like a dumb guard. Like, how does he get fooled? How does he not notice that that's a kid? I mean, I guess Asian don't raisin. <laughs> Come on. The guard sees Momo's ears and he's like, huh? Oh? And I feel anything. like when the doors closed, he's like a guard in a video game where he just resets and then turns back around like nothing happened. Like I guess it is like a Nickelodeon and kid show trope, like a dumb grown up or like dumb adult that you can easily trick. But even so, I just thought it was really funny how Aang started to tell him off. And then Katara and Sokka are just like, what is going on? I also love how Katara just like goes with it. Yeah. When Aang introduces himself and she's like, hi, I'm June, Pip and Patalopsicopolis. Nice oh. to meet you. I wonder if that has any meaning, like June. Well, there's a June character that's introduced later. Wait, who is that? The one with the with the tongue that paralyzes you. Oh, oh, her name is June. I think so. Yeah. The big titty goth girlfriend. I I guess if you want to put it that way, <laughs> the one that Uncle Iroh is like swooning over. <laughs> he is like a weird uncle. Of course, he's an Asian uncle. All Asian uncles hit on like younger women. It's gross. Speaking of old people, is this the first time we actually have an age for Aang? She's like Aang is a hundred and twelve years old. Like, is that the first time we actually get a solid age for Aang? Um... I'm pretty sure Sokka is 16, Katara's 14, Aang is 112, and then the best character is 8. Is this, like, when we find out that he's 12 years old plus 100? I think so. Actually, yeah. It's hard for me because I know Aang's always been 12. When I'm re-watching these episodes and recapping, I don't look for that because I'm looking for everything else, because instinctively I already know. So I think you're right. I think this is the first time they've established how old Aang is. Oh, also, shout out to Cabbage Man for the first time, right? Yes, first time Cabbage Man. <laughs> Wait, okay, so I'm confused. We see the Earthbender guard launch his cabbage All cart. cabbages. Because they, they were like rotten. Yeah. But then it's weird because later on you see him with another cart inside Omashu. Like where the hell did that come from? Does he live in Omashu or does he have just infinite carts of cabbages? He stole those cabbages from someone else. In my notes I just put don't give up cabbage man. <laughs> and then under it I put cabbage court. Yeah. Your day will come cabbage man. Not today though. Expect a lot of cabbages going bad. <laughs> Going back to like Katara and Sokka completely fascinated by Amashu because it's the first city they've seen. I love how Sokka's like, oh my god, they have buildings that don't melt. <laughs> I know. It's so weird. I think throughout the whole series, or almost the whole series, they're still in that clothing. Like the furry jackets and stuff. Like, no, that's not true because oh, yeah, when, yeah. Cause when they're in the South Pole, they have like full-on Eskimo clothing attire. And then they strip down to thinner ones. We see them wearing it like in Kiyoshi Island. Also, I want to point mm -hmm. out that when they are walking over the hill, you see the snow slowly disappear. Like, the end of the snow path is on that hill, and then the rest of the way, Omashu is just dirt. And so this is the start of their getting away from the South Pole and into terrain. And so I thought that was a little touch I noticed that I didn't before, like the change in scenery. I see. But yeah, I want to talk about the entrance to Omashu is fucking insane. You see, like, when they're looking at it, the bridge to get to the entrance is like a zigzag. I know. I would fall. Or like, what is it called? Vertigo? Yeah. I'd feel like I'm walking a tightrope. The cabbage man pushed his cart all the way through that zigzag, only to get it destroyed, just launched off. I would freak out. Like, I'm afraid of heights. I don't know how these earthbender, or like, this earth kingdom is not afraid to go through that path. 
Now I feel like it'd be an air nomad thing to be high up and away from everybody. Whereas like Earth Kingdom would be lower to the ground. It reminds me of Mario Party. I remember the um, one of the Mario Party mini games is like you have to pass the baton or whatever, and you're walking on like oh. really narrow. Yeah, that's an old one. That's like a. What are you talking about? We just played it. Huh? There's a mission on the new Mario Party that's like that. Passing the baton. Or you're passing something. Yeah. I'm thinking about Mario Party Two on the N64, where like everybody's penguin bodies. And then you have to keep tapping A to waddle. And there's a spot where it's a zigzag. And then if you fall off, you just die. And yeah. you have to restart. <laughs> if we visited a Masha, that'd be us. Yeah, I would fall. That's it. That'd be my journey's end. As I just fall off and die. Wait, aren't you the one that wanted to be an earthbender? Of course. I think it'd be really cool to live in Omashu, but I don't know. I'd probably have to like walk blindfold like bird box up. <laughs> Somebody would have to take me there. I don't know. That seems really narrow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I can see why the Fire Nation is having a hard time conquering the Earth Kingdom. Because if you're an earthbender guard, you can collapse that bridge so easily. And the firebenders have no way to... That we know of yet, no way to cross that. Also, when the gang walks through the gates, it takes a team of earthbenders to open up a gate that has like three walls. Yeah, the gate is thick. The gate is very thick. <laughs> and they open it up one by one. It's got to be like, what, thousands of tons to move that gate? That's true. But then later on, we figure out they have the technology to take over Bossing Say. They have those giant drill tanks that can ride up walls. But it is a pretty long journey. So, yeah, it makes sense that they're not captured yet or they're not taken over yet by the Fire Nation. But yeah, we really see the power of Earthbenders in this episode, and it's pretty awesome. That's why they're the best. <laughs> but I mean, later on, we'll see during the fight scenes. That's one of the reasons why I fell in love with Earthbending over anything else. Also, I want to talk about how Aang is like when he full on embraces the role of being an old man and he calls himself like Banzu Pippin Padalopsicopolis. He's so fearless. He's so confident, like what Joanna said. I don't know, like I wouldn't be able to <laughs> lie my way like that. When Aang sees the guard roughing up the cabbage man, he tells Katara, he's like, just keep smiling. <laughs> and Katara is like trying not to freak out. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder how long that drop is. They even looked over the ledge, all scared, like, oh, fuck. Oh, going back to Katara going with the flow and going with, like, Aang's lie of her being the granddaughter. It reminds me of, like, a meme I saw the other day. And it's, like, a screenshot of two scenes from Avatar. Mm. And one of them is this scene where Aang's, like, lying. And the Katara's like, hi, I'm Jin Pippin Padalopsicopolis. Right below that is a screenshot of the scene when they're in the Fire Nation. And Aang's in that Fire Nation school, right? And he gets in trouble and they go to, like, a parent-teacher conference. The teacher or the principal is like, what are your guys' names again? And then Sokka's like, fire, Wang fire. And this is my wife, Sapphire. And then Katara just goes with it too. And she's like, Sapphire Fire, nice to meet you. <laughs> and then below that, the meme's like, you gotta find a girl that can cover you for your lying ass. <laughs> yeah, she is the brains of this group of friends. She's a necessity. Of course, you have the avatar, but like without Katara, Sokka and Aang would probably die. <laughs> like you see her help them in this episode too, towards the end. Back to Omashu. The camera pans out to reveal Omashu in all of its glory. Aang points out the Omashu delivery system and explains how it works. Earth Benny brings the packages up and gravity brings it down. He tells them how his friend Boomy came up with another way to use the delivery system, which leads us to a flashback. Boomy tells Aang to look around them and asks Aang, what do you see? Aang's like, uh, the mail system? And Boomy's like, no, instead of seeing what they want you to see, you gotta open your brain to the possibilities. He throws up his hands and yells out, the world's greatest super slide. Aang tells Boomy that he's a mad genius, and Boomy starts laughing slash snorting. The two jump on a cart and ride down the super slide. We cut to Katara, Sokka, and Aang on a cart, getting ready to slide down the super slide themselves. Aang promises them that they'll head to the North Pole after this ride. 
Katara starts freaking out when she looks down and before she can back out, Aang tips the cart over and the gang shoots off. Aang is laughing his head off, but then things get serious when they see a cart carrying a bunch of spears coming up from behind them. Aang teeters off the path to avoid the spears, and it works. The gang slides down a couple of rooftops, interrupts a military training session, and manages to get back onto the path. Katara tells Aang to use his airbending to help, and Aang is like, you're right, we can go faster. <laughs> and so he airbends, and they go faster, and Katara is losing her shit. She starts freaking out, and for a good reason, they destroyed like half of the city. After crashing into a million things, the gang finally comes to a halt. When they crash into a man's food cart, the man yells out, my cabbages! And the gang gets arrested by the Omashu guards. We cut to the inside of the king's throne room. The guards tell the king of the gang's crimes, including vandalism, traveling under false pretenses, and malicious destruction of cabbages. The camera pans to the right, and we see cabbage men yelling, Off with their heads! Everyone's waiting for the king to say something, but when the king opens up his mouth, he says, Throw them a feast! And everyone's like, what? We cut to the gang at the dinner table with a buffet of food laid out in front of them. The king tells them how the people of Omashu got really fat from having too many feasts, so all of their meats have no skin on them. Aang tells him thanks, but that he doesn't eat meat. He turns to Sokka, and he's like, I bet you like meat, and shoves the drumstick in his mouth. <laughs> and Sokka's like, mm, okay. Katara thinks the king is crazy, and the king starts questioning Aang and asks him where he's from. Aang lies and said he's from Kangaroo Island, and the king makes a bad pun, and no one laughs except Sokka. The king then tells the gang that he's going to head to bed, but before he does, he throws a drumstick at Aang, and Aang stops it by airbending. Everyone gasps. The king tells the soldiers that Aang is an airbender, but not just any airbender. He's the Avatar! Dun dun dun! No! And we're back. No! When we started brainstorming this podcast and before we started recording, Eddie was messing around and he was like, hey, we should really have musical cues. And then we like... That's the best one. <laughs> I guess we can use musical cues in this episode because it's a pretty lighthearted slash fun episode. Yeah, like it. I don't want to call it a filler episode. It's an episode that isn't heavy on plot. Yeah, and... It is really fun. Like, there's not a lot of strong views and opinions. I don't know, like the Kyoshi Warriors and like Sokka being sexist, and then you see Monkeyatsu. women power and stuff. Like, it's kind of hard to find things in this one. It's just fun. It's just an enjoyable episode. Debatable, and we'll get to that. There is something at the end I want to talk about. When Aang was talking about the delivery system and how good the mail system is, and Sokka's like, they probably get their mail on time, and then Aang's like, they do get their mail on time. While he, they were talking about that, I was just thinking, like, this is Amazon Prime or something <laughs> like that. I mean, I work for Amazon. That's what I was thinking about. Omashu equals Amazon Prime? Question mark. Yeah, the delivery system is very advanced. It's something that I kind of wish we had in real life, if benders did exist, how useful that would be. Like how gravity pulls it down. The whole city is a hill. It's like SF on a much smaller scale. But holy shit, when they walk in and they see the city of Omashu, it's so gorgeous. Like I'm trying not to compare it to Basingse because we're not there yet, but as of now, even with us knowing what Ba Sing Se looks like, Omashu is still freaking gorgeous. Oh my god. Yeah, it is weird how it's structured. Or I guess like it's smart how it's structured. It's a giant cone. So like they said, they use gravity as a cone. Everything will just fall easily down and then they just earth bend it back up with not that much effort. So it's smart how they constructed it. And the architecture too and all the shoots and everything. They even have like the, what is it, the, the spinning wheel things you see at the airport or like at checkouts or when people scan your shit, you know? Oh, like the rolling slides? Yeah, the rolling kind of slides. Thing. Omashu is so advanced compared to like anything we've seen before. I feel like they were the most advanced is the Earth Kingdom. 
feels like they're more of the cities and then you have the monks of the air nomads and then you have like these tiny little water tribes yeah and then i like how omashu doesn't have to rely on steel or like the industrial revolution to function they're perfectly fine with dirt and just bending dirt it reflects in their architecture it reflects in their delivery system their their gates their borders even like the bridge to cross to get in it's just so fascinating to watch I wonder if I feel like Boomy can metal bend. If he tried. Yeah, I was about to say it's because they don't have the best bender Toph yet, Toph the metal bender, but I don't know. I feel like Boomy could do it. I think that's something I wanted to see. Like looking back now, it would have been awesome to see like a Toph versus Boomy fight, but maybe that wouldn't be a good thing because you don't want to compare them. Like they're both really strong, powerful benders in their own. Tops better. Wow. No, stop. <laughs> yeah, I I can agree. Toph is better, but I think the first fight, Boomy would win because obviously he surpasses Toph by like a hundred and. He has to be about a hundred and twelve. Yeah, he's a hundred and twelve. Oh, another thing I wanted to bring up is like. I'm so mad at my younger self. Past Eddie. Yeah, like, how the fuck did I not realize that the kid that they flashed back to was Boomy? Yes! The king of Omashu. <laughs> yes! Like, <laughs> like, I'm so stupid. No. It's so obvious. Like, you can see it in their eyes. He has that little Forrest Whitaker twitch kind of like one eye is. I'm like doing it, but I know you can't see it in the podcast. But like, one eye is like twitchy. And the other one's like super wide. How the fuck did I not realize that until the end? Like I was shocked. Like, oh my god, that, that's Boomy. No, that's not just you. It was me too. Like when I was taking notes, I was like, past Marilyn, how the fuck did I not know that? Like it really was a shocker to me when it was revealed like plot twist. I just roll my eyes every time I see Kid Boomy now. Don't beat yourself up too much. We watched it when we were really young and a lot of things like go past our heads. Just were we young? Past. Yeah, we were like Drax. We were like, uh, taking things too literally. <laughs> I guess middle schoolers are young, but come on. I don't know. That was really obvious. Shout out to the people that saw it instantly. Back to the mail system. I've always wanted to ride a roller coaster. That was similar to that. Like, that looks so fun. No, there's no seat belts. I mean, in the roller coaster that they would make, I'm sure they would put seat belts. But I'm just saying, if there was like Nickelodeon land, they should have made a roller coaster. I'm pretty sure in this episode, there's like a scene where they went from like maybe 60 miles per hour to zero. They should have died. <laughs> Brianna's voice in my head. They should have died. <laughs> no, because like in Magic Mountain, the Superman ride goes from zero to 70 in like a couple seconds. That's what the ride's all about. So, But that's taking off. That's not crashing into something and stopping. I really like this episode and we'll talk about it later when they finally do meet the king. But this episode is really fun to watch because it messes with your expectations like when they do get off the path when they're super sliding and they just like crash and everything there's a scene where there's like these wooden sticks or whatever that are propped up against a wall and you think they're just gonna like launch off of it but then they don't because the shoot in them are heavier than the sticks so it just breaks and then they just go crashing down i need to see a visual Ugh. Hopefully the listeners know what I'm talking about. Maybe I need to like go back and look at the timestamp and be like, yo. I have a timestamp. It's six minutes and 44 seconds in. And that's all I really want to say. For what? I don't know. Like if you're able to go and watch that and cut to six minutes and 44 seconds in, like Aang's face always gets to me. So they're going down the roller coaster. They're all screaming and they see this cart go by in front of them. And they're like freaking out. The one with the spears? No, that was behind them. I don't know what it was, but I just remember there was a cart in their way and they were going to crash into it. Right. That's when they start screaming. And then it gets moved out of the way. And then they have this sigh of relief and Aang's face. <laughs> I don't know. I had to pause it and then just stare at it for a while. I also want to point out, when they do line up for the king, they show the gang, and then the camera pan zooms into Aang, 
it cuts to Boomy going like, hmm? And I picked up on that this time. And Boomy knows, like he sees Aang and he's like, huh. Yeah, he's like tripping out because he still looks 12. Yeah, and he's trying not to say anything. I wonder, no, because he is crazy. Like he's always been crazy. How the hell did Boomy become king? Like, is there a backstory with Boomy? Is it just like he's so buff and strong nobody wanted to mess with him? Or like he's so crazy nobody wanted to mess with him? Well, he did say that later when they are battling, he did say like, you thought I was a frail old man, but I'm the best earthbender you'll ever meet. So he's just macho, like regardless of how crazy he is, because he was the greatest earthbender. They're just like, all right, you're king. I mean, you said it yourself, like the guards aren't that bright. I'm pretty sure Boomy is like the brightest person in that city that is an earthbender that can defend the city. He can defend the city by himself. He took back Omashu by himself. I'm pretty sure he had like a hundred years to prove that he's ready to lead and be king. It's crazy how people don't question him or he doesn't have an advisor. It's like, uh, I don't know if we should do that. King Boomy, what should we do? And it's like, uh, we should have another feast. I mean, that's actually, side note, one of the reasons why I would choose to live in Omashu. All that food. How many feasts did they have where they had to start cooking healthier because everybody's getting fat in Omashu? That's heaven. That's a place I want to live. <laughs> but oh my god, so Cabbage Man wanted to execute a bunch of kids. He legit was like off with their heads. Oh yeah, one for each. One for each cabbage. Head, head of cabbage, yeah. Like either one, he must really love cabbages. Or two, there's something wrong with him. I mean, did you see how he was like hugging the cabbage? He was like putting it towards his cheek and like rubbing the cabbage right before they Wait. crashed into his cabbage cart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Aang's a vegetarian. I guess that makes sense because he's like a monk. I don't know, do monks eat meat in your Buddhist monks? Yeah, we feed them all the time. <laughs> like my mom would always cook things for them and they would eat meat. They eat meat? Yeah. But past Marilyn feels so stupid because I don't know why it clicked in my head. But this is like the first and only instance they nod to Aang being a vegetarian. And then he doesn't mention it later until when he's on the lion turtle and he's talking to one of the avatar, one of his past avatar lives. And he's like, you understand me? Like, that's why I'm a vegetarian. Like, I appreciate life. It took me two, three years to be like, oh my god. Aang is a vegetarian! And I just felt so stupid when that happened. I think I was 14. <laughs> yeah, I guess that makes sense that he's a vegetarian. I could never be one though. What's that religion where they sweep away bugs? They don't even kill bugs. Yeah. We took that world religion class at one time, remember? Yeah, yeah. I remember we were like watching a video of them sweeping bugs. Or like sweeping wherever they walk. They like walk with brooms yeah. to make sure that they don't kill anything. So I forgot what it was. I wanted to say it was some type of Buddhism, but I don't know. Oh, one of the best scenes was like, what were you talking about? Was it with Mark or with Yen? Where you're talking about your um your old professor. Um, you used that word, <gasps> yeah. homo, what is it? Homoerotic undertones. Homoerotic undertone. There was no undertone. That was like, that was just homoerotic. Like the part where Aang's like, oh no, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat meat. And then he just turns to Sokka and then he's like, I bet you like meat. And then he shoves a drumstick in Sokka's mouth and Sokka's like, mmm. I don't know. <laughs> like I would drop like a Brazzers logo on that. Have you seen those memes? No. With the Brazzers logo. <laughs> where it's like something that looks sexual. That's weird. Like, it's a hundred and plus year old man who, like, shoves a meat into a 16 year old boy's mouth. No, that's not. Oh, fuck, they're playing together. Are we gonna get sued? I don't know. Are these free licensed noises? Fine, I'll stop. I don't know. I didn't want to mention it because I don't know if it's appropriate because he is, like, an old man and Sokka's underage. But that still is very, like, abrasive. How <laughs> he just shoves something. And Sokka just accepts it. Sokka does love meat. No, just kidding. Team mm -hmm. Suki. Mm -hmm. Team Suki. Mm -mm. Would it be Bumaka? I see a lot of ships, if not all the ships on Instagram. There's Zuko and Sokka. There's Sokka and Azula, which doesn't make sense to me at all. It'd be like Azula and Bumi. Just two crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh. 
I don't think I've seen Sokka and Aang yet. That would be weird as fuck. But... You slash girl? No. <laughs> but anyways, back to the dining room. Aang's like, okay, you caught me. I'm an airbender. He tries to like be all suave and talk his way out of it and leave, but the guards stop him. Katara says that the king can't keep them there. And she's like, let us leave. And the king's like, let us leave? And starts chewing on some leaves. And Sokka whispers to Aang that the king is like batshit crazy. <laughs> and right when he says this, the king announces that Aang will have to face three deadly challenges the next day. Only then can he leave. He tells the guards to throw them in the chambers, and the guards like, um, which chamber, sire? The good chamber or the bad chamber? And the king responds by saying, take them to the newly refurbished chamber that was once bad. And the guards take them to the rooms, and Katara's like really impressed with how nice it looks. She's like, wow! And Aang's like, he did say it was newly refurbished. And Sokka's like, dude, we're still prisoners. We gotta get out. Aang wonders what the challenges are going to be, and Katara tells him that they really shouldn't stick around to find out. Aang tries to stuff Momo through like a tiny air vent, and it doesn't work because Momo's too big. Katara tells fat. him- He's not fat. That air He's vent- He's too fat. No, that air vent's so tiny though. No, he could have made it. They showed him with the gut, like he was eating the feast with them. True. So he was chubby. <laughs> Oh, I guess Boomy was right to like. Um... He knew it all along. <laughs> See, he is a good king. I bet you like me. No. <laughs> Anyways, um, Katara tells Aang to get some rest for the challenges tomorrow, and Aang reluctantly agrees. We cut to the middle of the night. The guards wake Aang up for his first challenge. Aang notices that Sokka and Katara are gone and asks where they are. The guard tells Aang that he has to complete all of his challenges in order to free his friends. He takes Aang's staff away from him and leads him to the king. The king asks Aang what he thinks about his new outfit, and Aang doesn't really know what to say and ends up saying something like, I don't know, looks fine I guess. The king says that he passed the first test, and Aang's like, really? And he, the king's like, nah. <laughs> Aang gets annoyed and starts yelling at the king to give him his friends back so they can leave. The king expected this from Aang, so he puts Gemini rings on Sokka and Katara. Right when the guards put the rings on them, they start growing. The king explains that Gemini is also known as Creeping Crystal. It's crystal that grows remarkably fast, and by nightfall, they'll be completely covered by it. Aang agrees to do the challenges. We cut to a cave filled with spikes. And I had to look this up. So the word is stalagmites? Stalagmites. Stalagmites. Is it stalagmites? You sure? <laughs> Hermione. Hermione. Stop it. Stalagmites. All right. So they're in a stalagmite. And in the middle of the stalagmite is a waterfall. And in that waterfall is a chain, and at the end of the chain is a key, and below the key is a ladder. The Genomite is already covering up half of Sokka and Katara's arm. The king tells Aang that he's hungry, and tells Aang to fetch him his lunchbox key. Aang tries to climb up the waterfall by using the ladder, but the waterfall currents are too strong. He climbs up higher, this time, as high as he can on the stalagmites, nose dives into the waterfall, but the current is too strong yet again. Aang slams onto one of the spikes and hangs onto it so he doesn't fall. The king taunts him and Aang gets annoyed. He snaps the spike that he's holding onto in half, hops on top of it, and air bends it towards the king. The spike hits directly above the king's head and the king's dangling from it. Aang's like, there, enjoy your lunch. I want my friends back now. <laughs> and the king's like, nah, -uh, not yet. I need you to find my pet Flopsy. We cut to like a crater-like playground where we see Aang trying to find Flopsy. He sees a bunny and he's trying to sweet talk it to like come near him. And he's like, come here Flopsy. And then a huge beast plops up from behind Aang and tries to grab him. The bunny runs away and Aang starts chasing after it. And the beast starts chasing after Aang. The bunny goes inside the rabbit hole and Aang tries to reach inside but then realizes something. He stands back up, turns around and sees the beast full on charging at him and yells out, Flopsy? And the beast immediately stops and starts licking Aang. It turns out the beast is Flopsy, not the bunny. The bunny was a distraction. The king whistles and calls Flopsy over. He starts petting him and Aang checks up on Katara and Sokka to see how they're doing. And they're not doing good. 
the crystals have covered at least like three-fourths of their entire body and they're running out of time but yeah where do we start well that was a lot <laughs> yeah a lot happened <laughs> I just want to point out that there's like a lot of vignettes in this episode. Vignettes? What? I think they pronounce it vignettes. You know when you're editing like a photo? It's like a something you put on the border. You could like make it darker or you can make it lighter. There's like a lot of vignettes in this episode, especially when they zoom in on Boomy. And then I also noticed a lot of Dutch angles. Did you pick up on that? There are like a couple of Dutch angles. The king's telling Aang to hurry up because the Genomites are growing. And then it's like a close-up of Katara and Sokka's arm. And so it like zooms in and it tilts the camera. Mm. Yeah, and he gives it like a creepy factor. I think it's kind of morbid that the king is... I mean, he's not really going to kill them, but it seems like he's about to kill two kids with rock candy. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> What does he call him? The creepy... Creeping crystals? The creeping crystals. Like it's in the shape of a ring. Is it symbolizing marriage? <laughs> no. How you put it on and it slowly creeps at you and engulfs you and then you die. Are you passively aggressively telling me you want a divorce? Mm -hmm. Wow, Eddie. Mm -hmm. Your true colors come out in this podcast. I need a boomy in my life. Wow. One thing that I... Brushing that off. One thing wow. that... <laughs> All of our listeners probably think we hate each other. We literally mm -hmm. just got married. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> He's joking. You love me, right? Anyways, what were you saying? And we're back. <laughs> so it's kind of fucking weird that Boomy has a cave. He has a cave with the waterfall and then there's a ladder under the waterfall. Like he just has that. I always wondered, what's that for? Like, what does he do with that? Did he just build that now? Is the key always there? Did he place the key there? Or is this guy like just really protective with his lunchbox? Like, these <laughs> are the questions. I think he's just very dramatic and very extra. He's so extra in this episode. Yeah, I mean, he has a gorilla bunny. Flopsy. As a pet. That's nightmares right there. Like a giant bunny gorilla chasing you down with tusks. Is it is it a gorilla bunny? It looks like a gorilla bunny. It looks swole. Yeah. It's like if Yen was a bunny. <laughs> but even like the design of the throne room too. It's very like dimly lit, green filter. Yeah, and how he dresses, like who wore it better? Boomy or Loki? Wait for what? His outfit. Like the purple or the one before that? I mean I guess both, but yeah, he oh, had right. green and he had the those like horns or whatever. The horns were like sideways though. Yeah, the they side. like angled like Loki's, like oh. a ram. Boomy wore it better. Yeah. Fight me, fight me. <laughs> I mean, the other guy's a magician. But yeah, I love Boomy. Yeah, in my notes, I didn't really have a lot of things. I feel like there's not a lot to analyze. It's more to enjoy. I just enjoyed this episode. Like even watching it for like the 10 millionth time. Because I feel like this is one of the episodes that Nickelodeon kept playing. Maybe that's the reason why they always play it. Is like you don't really need to know plot for this one. Yeah, you can jump right in. Yeah. But I did notice that I know it's only like what episode five, but this is like the most attitude we see from Aang when he is provoked like that. It's so ironic because Aang's usually the one that's annoying, but he can't handle how annoying Boomy is and how Boomy is not serious with anything. <laughs> it's like Aang can't handle what he dishes out. Yeah, but they were like best friends. Yeah. Like when they were younger, or I guess to Aang, it's still now. I just remember not liking Flopsy. It just looked weird. Like it looked creepy. <laughs> That's scary, man. Like if you see a Flopsy behind you, if Flopsy was chasing you, I would probably shit my pants. And it's kind of weird how Boomy whistles to Flopsy and Flopsy's like acting like a little puppy and then he's scratching his belly. It's similar to like Pokemon, like if you're like petting Machoke. Oh. This buff humanoid kind of thing. It's not as cute as like scratching a puppy's belly. I wouldn't pet a gorilla like that. That's weird. Well, Boomy is that shit crazy. <laughs> But like in a good way. 
I love how when Aang does check up on Sokka and Katara, oh my gosh, Katara has so many quips in this episode, it's so funny. Usually Sokka is like the funny one, right? But in this episode, Katara's like spot on when Aang's like, oh, how are you doing? And Katara's like, other than the crystal slowly encasing my entire body, I'm great. And then we see Sokka's crystal, Katara's crystal is growing in like a different shape than Sokka's crystal. And when Sokka's crystal grows, he like falls over. Yeah. Is it the same? It can't be. Yeah, it is. It's the last episode of season two when Aang puts on the uh, that crystallized green armor. Yes. I was like, when I saw that, I remember thinking back to this episode. Wow. And I'm like, does he have rock candy armor? Like, it can't be, but it's weird. I think that's a different type of It crystal. has to be, but it's the same color. I don't know. Rock candy armor. Going back to how stupid we were when we first watched this episode, <laughs> I remember watching the challenges and not knowing how the fuck to solve them. Yeah. And then when Aang does solve them, I'm like, oh, wow, I would have never thought of that. I would definitely be a horrible avatar. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about like... Just crossing the bridge, you would just die. So if I didn't die from crossing the bridge to get into Omashu, or when he was making fun of Aang for climbing up the waterfall, I was like, oh, what if he just dives down from the top of the waterfall? Which is also stupid, because then the current would just push him into the ladder or the stalagmite, and then he would die. So that's how I would die the second time. And he also almost shanked his balls, like <laughs> that close call he had. Oh, yeah, when he landed and... He did the splits. Oh, God. Oh, man. <laughs> and what is it, like the anime mushroom puff? Yeah, the sigh of relief. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. A lot of uh, homoerotic undertones. He almost got his butt penetrated by a stalagmite. Anyways... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about it because Boon, he's like 112 years old. So is Aang, remember? But he was mentally frozen. There's a difference between like being mentally frozen in Boomy growing and knowing, oh. Age is just a number. What if he's like Dumbledore? Like you see, Boomy doesn't have a family. So he is gay. Does it allude to that? The similarities between him and Dumbledore are very close. I don't know. <gasps> Do you think Boomy had a crush on Aang when they were kids? I think Boomy was just not there. Like, all <laughs> there when they were kids. He's not there ever. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, he does look <laughs> creepy. Growing up, I didn't like Boomy as much as I do now because he just looked creepy. And wow, then... Eddie. Wow. I mean, it's good call. He would like invite me over to a feast and then he'd be like, I bet you like meat. And I'm like, uh-huh. And then <laughs> where would that lead us? Oh, God. To a dark cave of stalagmites. <laughs> Anyways, um, going back to the challenges and what I mentioned earlier, like Aang is really bright. He's like a really bright kid. This 12 year old is just showing us up. I kid you not, I think if I watched Avatar for the first time now and watching this episode at the age of like 26, I would not be able to figure out these challenges. I don't know, that was a big risk, the second one. Yeah. Like he's like, hmm, maybe the one chasing me is Flopsy. Turns around, what if it wasn't? There goes Aang, dead. It reminds me of, I don't know if there's anyone out there that has watched all of the Mission Impossible movies like I have <laughs> leading up to Mission Impossible Fallout, but in Mission Impossible Fallout, they finally call Tom Cruise's character out on his bullshit and it's like, how is that a plan? You're just gambling with our lives. And he's like, yeah, it's worked so far. And I think that's what Aang does because we see Katara is Aang's conscious. He doesn't really think ahead. He lives in the moment. He is impulsive and he just goes with his gut feeling. Yeah, he goes with the flow. You're right. Like Sokka likes to plan things out. I think back, I don't even know what episode it is, where he screams sneak attack. Sneak attack. It like, can't be a sneak attack if you're yelling sneak attack. <gasps> melon Lord. When they're fighting the Melon Lord. Was it Melon Lord? Lord? No, it has to be. Else. I don't know. But yeah, you're right. Katara thinks about things before she does it. Usually. I mean, again, they're all kids though. So it, it really makes sense. Like that's Aang's character that he kind of just like goes with it. Or like if it works, it works. And it's also like great screenwriting too. Because the previous episode with the warriors of Kyoshi and the Unagi. Like who would have thought that Aang would use the Unagi to put out the fires? 
Like, I would have never thought that. And it just goes back to, like, the concept of Chekhov's gun. My brother, like, explained this to me a while ago. But Chekhov's gun is based off of Anton Chekhov, a playwright in, like, the late 1800s. And he argued that everything in a story has to have a purpose. So, like, you can't put random things in a movie or in a TV show that leads to nothing. You shouldn't make false promises to the audience. And mm -hmm. so like these screenwriters are very smart because every scene is important. You see this with Boomy in Boomy's episode, like every shot is important. You see it in like the previous episode with the Unagi and how it's just like a full circle every time. And I guess the phrase like Chekhov's gun comes from, because he used to write plays like back when before television was a thing, you know, like people were entertained by plays. And so he argued that if you're going to put on a play and for the first act of your play, you hang a gun by a rope in a scene, mm -hmm. it's expected that that gun's going to be used later. Because if you're not going to use that gun later in the play, why the fuck would you hang a gun there, you know? Mm. But yeah. Chekhov's gun in like every episode of Avatar. That's interesting. Shout out to Dylan. Yeah, he's 16. I'm still learning things from him. That's crazy. So he's as old as Sokka. Yeah, he also watches like a lot of YouTube videos. Oh my god. So I know I mentioned earlier, I know you would be an earthbender. You've told me like a million times. There's a lot of cool tricks that I can think of doing with earthbending. Like how Toph skated on the earth. You can think about like hovering rocks under you so you can fly. I don't know. Like, Boomy and Toph, though, they're the ones that really had me going for earthbending. That one scene where, like, after... We're going, getting ahead of ourselves, but after Aang fights Boomy, and then Boomy just, like, crosses his arms, and then he falls backwards into the ground. And, and Aang's, Aang's like, like, oh! oh? <laughs> what? And then he just, like, twists up into, like, three stories high, and he's there. That's crazy. <laughs> I want to mention a new segment I've been working on. And it's called, it's a work in progress, but right now the title I have is, What? You've never seen Avatar? W-Y-N-S-A for short, or Wisna. Wisna? So, <laughs> we'll think of a better title. Leave ideas in the comments below. We went over to your parents' house over the weekend, and your sister and cousin was there. Malia, mm -hmm. Eddie's sister, is nine, and his little cousin, Marley, is three. And so I was like, hey, you want to watch Avatar? And then Malia was like, okay. So I put it on for her, right? So I took notes while they were watching it. Malia was like sort of watching it. She kept getting distracted. I mean, she's nine years old. Plus, Marley brought over like a balloon kit. And so they were like simultaneously making balloons. But I noticed that there were some parts that they like paused to watch. And then your dad made them popcorn too. And so they like ate the popcorn while watching the first two episodes. Yeah, Marley looked way more interested than Malia. Oh my god, yes. Okay, so I kept pausing the show because Malia kept getting distracted. The first time I paused, Marley was like, what happened? And I was like, oh, I paused it. I'm waiting for Malia to come back into the room. And she was like, oh, okay. Malia comes back into the room and Marley's like, look, she's here. Okay, play it. And I'm like, ugh. Oh. I guess that's fair I did say that and so I play it but Malia's not paying attention and Marley's just like fully invested and so the whole time I kept like trying to pause it and Marley got so mad at me she was like I want to watch play it play it you even <laughs> tried to put on Spongebob yeah right? I tried to switch it to Spongebob because I thought she wouldn't notice but she like this three-year-old is so smart she definitely noticed yeah. that I changed like, it I don't want to watch Spongebob <laughs> Let me show you a couple of key moments that happened while a nine-year-old and a three-year-old was watching the first two episodes of Avatar. Malia asked a couple questions like, why does Zuko have a scar? And then I was like, you'll find out later, just keep watching. And then she also asked, why does Aang have an arrow in his head? <laughs> and then I was like, okay, like keep watching, they'll tell you. And then it gets to the scene where Zuko's practicing on the Navy ship. And Uncle Iroh's like, no, fire comes from the breath. And then Malia goes on this weird tangent. And she's like, airbenders can defeat firebenders because they use breath. And airbenders can control air, right? And she's like so confident. She's like, yeah, see? Also, waterbenders can beat firebenders because water can put out fires. Fire is really the weakest one. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, interesting. 
I think she completely tuned out the part where Katara mentions like the hundred year old war and the firebenders are nearly like almost done conquering. She missed out on a lot of things. She missed out on how Katara mentioned that her mom died. All of the really dramatic plot points she missed out on. I can see that though. I guess you don't really bring science into it. I get she's nine years old, but there's somewhat of a point. I think even Joanna brought it up, like, air and fire both come from the breath. Is Aang an oxygen bender? Like, what makes air? What defines air that he can bend air but then not fire? If he wasn't an avatar, because obviously he could bend fire because he's an avatar. Those are a lot of good questions. Now I do think that fire is the weakest. Because, like, what do you put out fire with? Sand? Water? You can blow it out with air. Yeah, but this whole show proves how strong firebenders can be. When Sozin's comment came, then yes. I bet you if there was the same amount of waterbenders during the Blood Moon, yeah, they could have wiped out the firebenders easy. If they had that malicious intent, yeah. Mm-hmm. They might be weak. I mean, they do get defeated. But anyways, that's based off of a nine-year-old saying that on the first episode, so... Your sister also pointed out it was um, the scene where Sokka and Katara go to save Aang. And they're flying on Appa, right? Mm -hmm. And she's like, why are they acting like it's normal? And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What's normal? How are they acting like that's normal? They're flying on a bison. And then I had to explain to her that she missed the scene before that where Sokka was freaking out that he finally made Appa fly. And it's like frustrating (laughs) with a nine-year-old that is just like bouncing off the walls and can't focus. But How old were we when we started watching? Middle school, right? Yeah, we were in middle school. So we were already double digits. But Marley, your three-year-old cousin, was, oh my gosh, she was so invested in it. I think she only took her eyes off the screen maybe like two or three times. Which is pretty good. There was one part where Katara and Aang were penguin sledding and they reach the Fire Navy ship and it's like dramatic music and Aang decides to sneak in, right? And she started freaking out. She was like looking around and she was like, pillow, girl, grab pillow. And I was like, what? And then I handed her a pillow and she went to a corner and like cuddled with it because she was scared (laughs) of that whole scene. And then she like immediately got distracted by something else and she wasn't scared anymore. But I thought that was so cute. (laughs) That's the end of our Winsa segment. And we're back to the final challenge. The king tells Aang that he can choose his next opponent to duel. There are two scary dudes standing next to the king. One's like really buff and the other has like a lot of pointy objects. And Aang's like, so whoever I point to, I have to fight? And the king's like, yes, choose wisely. And Aang decides to point to the king. Which is the completely wrong answer because the king, he takes off his robes and he's just insanely buff. Yeah, like chiropractors hate him. How the hell he fixed his back? Yeah. Like he was slouching the whole time and you heard the cracks in his back to stand up straight. My dad has a bad back. So whoever like Boomy's seeing, we need to get that chiropractor's number. Aang's completely terrified, and for a good reason. The king stomps his feet and throws Aang onto the battlefield. The king tells Aang that he's the most powerful earthbender Aang will ever meet, and Aang tries to take back his decision of choosing him, but it doesn't work. (laughs) The guard throws Aang his staff, and the king kicks a boulder at him. Aang dodges it, and the king taunts him by saying that his airbending tactic of avoiding and evading won't work. Aang tries to fly, but the king grounds him by creating debris from above. He tries to stop Aang with earth spikes, and Aang strikes back, but with an air slash? The king blocks it with the rock wall. He then turns the wall into like a surfboard and creates like a rock wave underneath him and aims it towards Aang. Aang tries to jump over this rock wave, but the wave curbs and smacks him to the ground. The king tries to hit him again, but Aang dodges. Aang starts running towards him from across the field, but the king turns the ground into quicksand and Aang starts sinking. He then tries to smash Aang with two boulders, but Aang dodges again. Aang bats a stream of air and knocks the king back. The king pulls a huge boulder towards him to hit Aang, but Aang barely dodges it by doing a backflip, which causes the rock to fly right towards the king. 
The king turns the boulder into dust and uses all of his might to lift up the balcony from off the ground to throw it at Aang. Aang starts freaking out and starts running in a circle, causing a mini tornado. As the king throws the balcony, Aang's tornado deflects it, and the balcony spins and launches back at the king. <laughs> the king splits the balcony in half to avoid the blast. This creates a perfect opening for Aang, and Aang pounces on the king to strike. He stops his swing right before he hits the king's head. Aang thinks he won, but a small pebble falls on his head, and he looks up and sees that there's a huge boulder about to crush him. Well done, Avatar, the king says. He throws the boulder aside, and earth bends back to where Sokka and Katara are. <laughs> The king tells Aang that he has to answer one final question. Aang argues back and says that that's not fair. The king responds by saying, what's the point of tests if you don't learn anything? Boom. <laughs> he then goes on to ask Aang, what's my name? And Aang's like really confused. Mike Jones. <laughs> Katara tells him to think about the challenges, and Sokka just thinks that his name is Rocky. <laughs> Aang recaps all the challenges out loud and notices that for each test, he had to think differently than he usually would. He tells Katara that he figured it out. We cut to the king's throne room. Aang tells the king that he solved the question the same way he solved the challenges and that he had to open his brains to the possibilities. The king starts laughing slash snorting. How did we not notice? We were so stupid back then. I feel so stupid now. <laughs> Aang tells Boomy that he's a mad genius and runs to hug him. Boomy starts blushing and tells Aang that he hasn't changed a bit. Literally, because he looks like a 12 year old boy still. He got the jokes. Katara and Sokka are yelling for help because the Geminite is now like completely almost encapsulating them. Boomy earthbends and the crystals explode and fly everywhere. He catches one and says that Geminite is made of rock candy and bites into it. Katara is really confused. Sokka questions Boomy and he's like, why are you so crazy and extra? And Boomy's like, I don't know, it's pretty fun messing with people. But all jokes aside, he tells Aang that he has a difficult task ahead of him. It's the duty of the Avatar to restore balance to the world by defeating Fire Lord Ozai, and he needs to master all of the elements. He then continues to tell Aang that whenever he does finally confront the Fire Lord, he hopes that Aang will think like a mad genius. Aang smiles and bows to Boomy. Boomy tells him that he's in good hands with his friends by his side. Aang thanks him for his wisdom. But before he leaves, they have to do one last thing. Ride down the super slide! And they do. The two ride throughout all of Amashu and the camera cuts to an extreme long shot of the city of Amashu. We hear a crash in the distance and we hear a man yelling out, My cabbages! <laughs> the episode ends. Da -da -da. And I feel like that's the actual my cabbages that you hear from here on out. Like, poor guy. It's okay. Your time will come, man. Cabbage court. He was basically in Brock's gym during the final challenge. And yeah, he had to choose which one. Yeah. Who would you have chosen? Um, being the dumb kid I was, I would not have chosen Boomy. <laughs> boom Boom. Boom Boom, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Mark. Maybe I'm... the pointy guy. Like, he looks scrawny, but he probably will cut me in a million pieces. I would die in those challenges. I would definitely die. <laughs> yeah, I would have gone for the buff dude with the halberd. He had a halberd, right? He had like the super long axe. Yes. I don't know. Should we talk about the fight scenes? You went pretty much into detail. It's so cool. It's so clever because Boomy's trying to... He's trying to teach He's trying Aang to teach Aang. While fighting. Sure, Aang's a hand quotes 12-year-old kid. But he's still the avatar and a master of airbending. And he's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. I mean, Boomy does have the upper hand because going to Pokemon, rock beats flying. Yeah, I thought that was so awesome how he grounded him by like shooting a boulder above him and hitting the roof and then like the debris fell down. And so Aang couldn't do what he usually does. Yep. And it's so great watching Boomy try to like one up him at every move. Like Boomy is like reading his mind because he knows him. That's like his best friend. He knows him. And so he's trying to push him, trying to make him think outside the box. And yeah. then you see Aang thinking outside the box. And that's what makes him a great avatar later down the line because he has to think like that if he's going to save the world. Yeah. And it's crazy because like Boomy actually wins. Yeah. Say in a real fight. Aang whacks Boomy in the head. Like, Boomy would, what, fall to the ground? Aang and would have been then, crushed. Yeah, Aang gets crushed. Boomy earthbends into the ground like it's sand. 
I thought that was one of the coolest things where Boomy turns the whole ground into quicksand. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. There's so much stuff you can do with earthbending. You can make your own weapons, which is pretty cool. I don't know what type of fighting style they used for Boomy, but it looked really cool. It was a very enjoyable fight scene compared to the other ones. Like, I think this was the first time you actually see earthbending. Like, a master of earthbending, too. Yeah. He's only second to Toph. It's so great because he can handle what he puts out, like when he pulls a boulder towards him. Like he knows it's going to hit him if Aang dodges, but that's if Aang dodges. And he does, but Boomy just like turns that into dust. And yeah. then when he throws the balcony, like holy shit, that thing probably weighs a million tons. Props to Aang for making like a mini tornado. Yeah, I was wondering how he didn't notice Aang running around in a circle making a tornado. But then I guess it cuts to Boomy and his eyes are closed. Because, mm. like, he's using so much of his strength to carry the balcony that he's not paying attention. Yeah. So that was kind of reckless of Boomy. He just threw it with his eyes closed. Then he opened his eyes. And then that's when he saw the tornado. And then it fling right back to him. And he splits it like it's nothing. Yep. And then Aang was right there cool pose and he's like check but boomy's like no checkmate oh man that battle was pretty epic yeah because you saw a master fighting a master yeah. like no offense to zuko right now but no zuko's still learning he didn't meet the dragons yet this whole episode was like a mystery episode with a bunch of puzzles in it and it's so fun to watch because you're trying to solve this puzzle too with the main protagonist <laughs> and then when they finally like reveal it you're like oh and so you feel smart even if you didn't figure it out yeah i feel like i've seen it before but like the trials thing i really like that the hero has to overcome trials to learn something that's like an asian action trope i think mean, it's just cool <laughs> <laughs> like he was never really in harm's way yeah like, he was all just like a it was just a mentor trying to teach the student. I was trying to think, does Aang really use this? The whole thing was to think outside the box. Think like a mad genius. Yeah. I mean, I guess removing Ozai's bendings, that's thinking like a mad genius. It's like, how do you defeat this all-powerful firebender? Make him into a normal human? Like, it's like, fuck, that's smart. Yeah, never mind. He learned something. Good job, Boomy. <laughs> He's part of the White Lotus, right? Yes, he okay. is. Um, yeah, I was thinking him and the dragon of Uncle the Iroh yeah, would be like best friends. They're so similar to each other. It's just a group of what Yen said. They're all just uncles. So it's just like the White Lotus is a group of Asian uncles just hanging out and like having fun. What are they? What's the White Lotus? Don't quote me on this. <laughs> wow. I'm paraphrasing. I think Uncle Iroh tries to explain it like a group of masters from all nations that extend past the limitations of politics. With that being said, when does Iroh join the White Lotus? Because he was a general in the army or did he... He was in it, and then, like, he had to make a choice, and he, he chose his family. He chose his nation over... It's very difficult for me to see Iroh as a bad guy. Or, like, as a general, killing people. Like, he had to have killed people. Yeah. It doesn't fit his character to me. Especially if you're a White Lotus. I guess it makes more sense if he became a White Lotus later in his life. Yeah, probably after his son died. He probably yeah. went on a huge solo journey around the world trying to find himself. And then he like ran into members of the White Lotus that guided him. Yeah. Oh, when Katara was helping Aang figure out the name. And then Sokka's like, I know, Rocky. And then Katara's like, we're going to keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll, we'll keep that as backup. Yeah. Oh my god, it's her like, quips. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking love Katara. <laughs> this episode, you gotta hand it to her. Like, her quips are really good. And like, here she is again, helping Aang. Yeah. Like, they really need Katara. She pretty much guided Aang into figuring out what to do. She's like, think about the trials. Maybe there was something in there that would help you. She kept guiding him to the answer, and then he finally got it. Yeah. It's Boomy. Yeah, they really bring out the best in each other. And, yeah. like, people argue for Katara and Zuko, but I'm going to argue against that, and I'm going to go into it later down the line. Like, But, yeah, I'm Team Katang. <laughs> yeah. That's the ship. It's hard for me to argue because I'm always with 
I'm a Peter MJ kind of person. Like, I didn't have feelings for Gwen Stacy at all because I knew he was supposed to be with Mary Jane. Same with this. I don't know, like, I just felt like Aang and Katara grew up and went through a lot together. Like, maybe she does fit better with Jet or, like... Zuko no at some point. Uh, people argue. Fuck I Jet. don't think. Yeah, Jet's stupid. Jet's cancer. We'll get Boom. when we get there. Happy he died. Anyways, there was no Appa in this episode. Uh, Wait, no, there was Appa. Just kidding. I, I take that back. In yeah. the beginning, there was Appa. Without Appa, there would be no Bonzu Pippin Padalapsacopolis the third. And they would have never gotten in. So technically, Appa saved the day. Momo <laughs> fucked up the day. <laughs> ate his ass off like just ate a lot and then got too fat and couldn't save them but that was a silver lining because i feel like ang definitely needed to go through those trials and hang out with boomy even though he didn't know it was boomy to like just hang out with him and this leads to what i wanted to talk about and how there is a line that boomy says when he's like talking to ang and he's like it looks like you're in good hands because you've got good company. And oh my god, that just broke my heart. Can you imagine like you're 12 and your best friend disappears on you and you don't know what happened to him? I feel like Boomy lived like two lifetimes because he's 112 years old. He's a 112 year old man and he sees his friend again, but this time he has new friends and he's like exactly the same. I can't help but think like Boomy probably thought about all of the what ifs. Like, what if Aang never disappeared? Like, they would have been friends forever. Yeah, that's why it was heartwarming to see them slide again. Yeah. Like they did in old times. But yes. all of the years lost, that's like very Captain America-like. My heart kind of broke too in like the first Captain America movie. When he wakes up and he's like in another timeline. And his whole life is gone. And, and he has to move on in some way. But back to Boomy. That was very tragic. Yeah, I guess I didn't really think about that. It is crazy. Like, he pretty much lost a friend. Or thought his friend was dead. Finds out that he's alive again. As Boomy, I would be happy to see one of my good friends that I thought died alive again. Yeah, and he is happy. I feel like if Boomy wasn't king, he totally would have been on the journey with Aang. Oh. Oh my god. But he had his duties. He's still the same though. He, even though he is an old man, he's still like a kid inside. Or that's just an old man. Like I just feel like old men like to crack jokes and just have fun. Oh my god. I just realized this. Like he lost Monkey Atsu, but now he has Boomy. Yeah, that's probably his last friend he has. From yeah. his previous life. Besides yeah. Momo and Appa. Who they can like communicate with each other. That's crazy. Oh, this is the first time they say Fire Lord Ozai's name, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I know Aang has a task, but was this like the first time you know like the big task at hand? I mean, I guess you always knew you had to take over the Fire Lord or like defeat, defeat the... Yeah, you had to defeat the Fire Lord. Yeah, and then in the recaps, they definitely use that clip from Boomy to like explain. But yeah, that's about it. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I mean, no, not really like... Again, there wasn't that much plot to talk about in this episode. It was just one of the fun ones. Yeah, and I also want to bring up, like, they deserve fun. Yeah. Like, these kids, they've been through so much shit. Like, the Southern Air Temple was the hardest on Aang. Oh my god. The shit he went through when he found out that his people were killed off. It was like mass genocide. And Monkey Atsu, finding Monkey Atsu's bones. I think that's the worst ever. And then like right after that, he almost single-handedly destroys Avatar Kyoshi's legacy of burning down like an entire island. That's his fault. Yep. And he learned from that mistake, but still like all that shame that he probably feels. It's so nice to finally see Aang like get something. I think we needed this episode too. Yeah. So much shit happened the first episodes one through four. And then we finally have just an episode where you can just enjoy it. This is definitely one of my favorite episodes too. Just because you're introduced to earthbending. So you get to see a little glimpse of it. Like you get more when Toph comes in. But this is just like a little taste of how cool earthbending or exciting earthbending is. Yeah, this was a fun episode for everyone except the Cabbage Man. <laughs> yeah. 
But again, he still goes at it and then he's going to get Cabbage Corp later and all's going to be good for him until he goes, I swear he goes bankrupt or something. <laughs> I just remember in Legend of Korra that scene where he's like pulled back by two guys oh. and he's like, my cabbages one mm -hmm. last time and then it cuts to Cabbage Corp. This guy can never get a break. I mean, he wanted to execute kids. That's a little extreme. For his cabbages. I'm so sorry if you're a vegan or vegetarian listening to this, but it's like that one thing where you go to a restaurant and it's a really fancy restaurant and they have like a whole paper of if you're going to eat a steak and it's like the cow's name, where it came from, and just like all of this info. So much love that goes into that food, right? And then you see the cabbage man and he's like grooming the cabbage, petting it, hugging yeah. it, and he hands it to a customer. He's like, here you go. I named this cabbage some weird name. <laughs> that guy was weird with cabbages. Boomy was weird with Sokka. This was a very weird, very fun episode. Yeah, I wish I had more analysis to say, but I think we kind of like, it's a different feeling knowing that's Boomy. Yeah. And like knowing the trials, nobody's in real harm. It was a really nice episode. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on this episode. <laughs> I'll bring you back with all of your sound clips. Call me when Toph's in. Quote me. At me. Avatar's not good until Toph comes in. Season 1 is a lot of exposition. It's like Parks and Rec where season 1 you kind of like get the feeling for all the characters and then they like got rid of that Mark character. Sorry Mark, Neely. I don't mean you, I mean the character. They got yeah, we need of... to get rid of that Boom Boom character. <laughs> Are there any plans for more music for this podcast? <gasps> I know you want to do the Lover of Two Caves episode. Yeah. Secret Lovers. <laughs> Ooh, maybe we should make that the intro. Oh, I guess like <laughs> another thing is there's like a popular song. I'm sure you guys know, but like Island in the Sun by Weezer. Back in high school, my best friends EJ and Willie, we made like a parody using Island in the Sun for Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm really happy with it. I'm really proud of it. If you can excuse my voice, then I guess. I do want people to hear the lyrics. I think it's fun. It was really enjoyable. I can't believe I made it in like 2009, I wanna say. It's like 2008, 2009. It was like a year after the show ended. I think so. Which is crazy, cause we didn't start dating until 2008. To our listeners, we are high school sweethearts. Mm. Although we just got married last year. Took us a while. <laughs> yeah. Here is a clip of Eddie doing a parody of Island in the Sun, but with Avatar lyrics. Blame me out, Hotman. When you're flying in the sky On a bison way up high With your friends around you On a journey across the sea We'll be soaring peacefully Drinking cactus juice all day Till we hallucinate Yip, yip Yip, yip Yip, yip Will you come along with me To defeat our enemy Grab the sword and boomerang And Ozai's head will hang in shame Take a journey across the sea We'll be soaring forcefully Sipping cactus juice all day Till we hallucinate We'll go and fight together Bend elements forever Because I am